Dobrze, dzień dobry, witamy wszystkich Państwa bardzo serdecznie. Jest to kolejny nasz wykład z serii Zapytaj Fizyka. I dzisiejszego gościa wyjątkowo zapowiem nie ja, ale będący dzisiaj z nami profesor Szymon Marinowski. Być może jest Państwu znany, jeżeli nie, to trzeba też koniecznie z jego działalnością się zapoznać. Zajmuje się on między innymi klimatem i tym, co się dzieje właśnie z naszą planetą, także mamy wielką przyjemność usłyszeć zapowiedź od niego. Dzień dobry Państwu, dziękuję, dziękuję bardzo Piotrze, dziękuję. I trzy słowa, ja, ja się, w, że tak powiem, włączyłem w tą zapowiedź, bo znam Dżuniciego od ponad ćwierć wieku i w różnych dziwnych okolicznościach się spotykaliśmy. Pierwszy raz próbowałem mu odwalić papier w dobrym czasopiśmie, jako jedna z moich pierwszych recenzji, który, który jednak przeszedł. Potem pracowaliśmy przy wielu różnych okazjach. Junichi skończył, znaczy jest absolwentem Uniwersytetu w Kyoto, ale potem pracował w bardzo różnych miejscach na świecie, w Stanach Zjednoczonych, w National Center of Atmospheric Research, między innymi miał kontakty z MIT, współpracował, pracował w Europie, na, w Hamburgu, na, na Uniwersytecie pracował, w tej chwili pracuje w Centrum Badań Meteorologicznych we Francji, Meteo France. Junichi jest specjalistą od tego, o czym będzie dzisiaj opowiadał, czyli jest specjalistą od geofizycznej dynamiki płynów, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics i konwekcji. Co to jest ta geofizyczna dynamika płynów? Geofizyczna dynamika płynów to jest dynamika cienkiej warstwy płynu na obracającej się kuli, więc to już trochę brzmi, że tak powiem, ciekawie. I właśnie w geofizycznej dynamice płynów efekty, jak my to mówimy, rotacji, rotation effects, są, są bardzo, bardzo istotne. One są bardzo nieintuicyjne. I, i dzisiaj Junichi opowie o tych nieintuicyjnych efektach geofizycznej dynamiki płynów. So, so Junichi, it's my pleasure to introduce you. And uh, I told that you will speak about non-intuitive effects of geophysical fluid dynamics. And yeah, please start. Okay. Wiem wieczu. Dziękuję bardzo za zapcieni. Miło mi was wazinieć. Moja lektura języka polskiego to Dąbrowska. Mówię po polsku zoe. Jednak a mówię po angielsku. So. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Don't, don't, never applause before the presentation finishes. This is very unpolite. Please not do it. <laughs> And that's, well, this is not I expected. Uh, number one. Please stop me. This is huge, relatively large hall, and you must be brave, but we brave young girls and young boys. And I accept questions in Polish and German, French, and English. And in case of Polish, Simon would translate it for me, and I would answer German, French, and English, depending on the language you ask. So that's number one. And about the talk, Um, well, it's, it's kind of thing to give this talk because many people come and it's for everyone and so on. And I wonder what I should talk about. And what I did was look at the website of this lecture series as well. But one of the activities of this Sapui Fiziki is you can ask actually question by email or put on internet, that part I didn't follow. And the faculty member would answer you. So I went through various questions, and one of the questions was, 
essentially this title, and more precisely, um, well, in, in English translation, this one. And the nice thing is, this question was already posted with, the, with an answer. So I look at the answer, and I said to myself, just give a talk based on this answer. So I don't know who actually answered this. So thanks to responder for this question. So, and well, answer the same question along the same line in a more careful way. So that's the idea of my talk. Now, so I think everyone can read this question. So it's, of course, it's about weather. Well, weather. Well, looks obvious. And this is only one philosophical slide, but I want to be philosophical that what is weather is actually a question of taxonomy. It's a bit unusual way of use of word, but um, book to read is Michel Foucault's Les Mots et Les Choses. If you don't know French, just type these words, and there must be Polish translation. And this is a very fascinating book, so I nowadays talk about every chance I got. This is about Western culture history over the last 300 years, and in short, how our taxonomy of knowledge has changed over those three years. So that context, and that's what I mean by taxonomy here. And well, so we are living in the beginning of the 21st century. So we kind of share the same taxonomy of knowledge, but not quite. Because it depends on your professionals, you're living in particular taxonomy. And well, you are in particular type of school and so on and so on. And you have particular family. And, and that brings you particular taxonomy of knowledge and vocabulary, the way you think. So even question of whether it's not obvious. So what do you think of weather usually? And to, so this is, I guess, what most of you would think with word weather. And to tell the truth, to get this image, I just typed weather image, images in Google. And I got this. Another one I got was this. And <laughs> those are equally nice. So I couldn't choose. So I decided to put two of them. Well, there are a bunch of symbols that shows what you would see when you heard the weather. So these are think, I think typically you think when we are told weather. Well, when you talk about weather, you think of those things. Fine. Now, if, well, there's something wrong here a little bit. Never mind. This is what atmosphere scientists think of weather when we say weather. In short, this is weather map. Um, most of you have seen like this on TV or so. This is distribution surface fracture, pressure. L corresponds low pressure. H stands for high pressure. And the value of pressure, value of millibar of hectapascal. And a bunch of lines. These are things called fronts. And then these triangles are called front. And these half circles are one front. And this is something you have to watch for, because weather suddenly changes by such with crossing of front and so on. So but for atmospheric scientists, weather means what you see on weather map. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Now, this is, well, over Atlantic Ocean. And Poland is somewhere over the. Oh. Oh, no, no, This is Italy. It's not to be somewhere around. Yeah, uh, just this oh, is. This one, this closest, yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. yeah, then this Atlantic Ocean. And if you look at more globally, this is the whole picture for Northern Hemisphere for winter and beginning of spring. This is equator and this is North Pole. And this, this is how pressure distribution typically looks like. And 
So this is our weather on the Earth. Uh, well, the something you would notice is those, well, pressure pattern getting broader and broader towards the equator. You see a very compact, uh, well, this must be high pressure and low pressure circles. And as you're getting closer to equator, this structure getting broader and broader. So that's kind of basic change of weather system with change of latitude. So to modify, to summarize this picture, this is same view over half hemisphere. We can take um, vertical section. This is pole and this equator. You get polar front and and then some circulation of it with cyclone, low pressure and high pressure. But if you getting closer to equator, this structure gets smoother. And something more, more dominant is more like a cellar vertical circulation going upward right at equator and going downward over subtropics. And so dry air comes from above to the surface. So we typically get desert in this subtropical latitude. It kind of rains a lot over tropics associated with this upward motion. Um, I was not sure if this one is better, but this is kind of more schematic that look at the same thing, only with section of height and latitude. So we see two types of weather at higher latitude. The weather system associated with cold front and low pressure and high pressure. Over tropics, we see uh, this vertical cell circulation called Hadre cell. So summary is we kind of see a traditional weather system somewhere around subtropics and in higher latitude we see a cyclone and fronts and more structure in longitude than over the tropics. Over the tropics we see this hardware cell circulation up at tropics and down over subtropics and structure of weather system is smoother in longitudinal direction. So that's what weather is on our Earth. And the question is, how this weather system, if, we, if Earth begins to rotate faster or slower? So just put the question here. Now, so next question is rotation. So Earth is rotating <laughs> and uh, this way, from west to east. And that's what rotation is we are talking about. Now, it's a bit tricky to imagine, but important thing is it's rotating very, very fast speed. But somehow we don't feel it. Maybe someone, I'm curious, who would feel it. And the reason we don't feel it is as this Earth rotates, all of us rotate the same way. So you're sitting here and you don't feel it, but this whole lecture theater is spinning round with the Earth. And this, we can do a simple experiment <coughs> using a pendulum and actually doing it a little bit complicated. But if you swing pendulum very careful way and then make a long story short, this pendulum is essentially hanging in middle of air, nowhere. So all of us are spinning except for this pendulum. So what C is, is this pendulum spin backward with time. Well, it takes about day to notice something about length of day as rotation, as first rotate. But this is actually because we are spinning round. And this, if you swing pendulum carefree in middle of air, this doesn't spin. And we see, we feel like this pendulum is swinging and don't be all of us actually spinning except for this pendulum. That's what rotation is, in short. 
Now, so that short summary. So what, how rotation works in weather? So I think this is something I hope you learn at school, very schematic picture of chain of low pressure, high pressure over high latitude. And what we learn is around low pressure, wind goes round in counterclockwise direction. And along high pressure, wind goes round clockwise direction. And essentially following constant pressure line. So in short, this is a consequence of because Earth is rotating. And that brings a force called Coriolis. And this kind of short explanation how it works. With, imagine you got the low pressure to the left and high pressure to the right. And then you got high pressure presses the low pressure part from right to left. So you have a pressure force this way toward the left. So naively, winds would blow from high pressure to low pressure following this pressure force. But there's another force called Coriolis. And then this Coriolis and pressure force balance each other. And winds follow the line of constant pressure. And this Coriolis force is proportional to rotation rate. Now, I thought of how to explain this force, but it's hard. Then I can make a very simple example that imagine again you swing this ball tied by rope this way. If you swing it, you feel like your, your ball is pulling up away from you and that is force called centrifugal force. And, but this is called mutual force. It's not actually body pulling far away. You just feel like it. And then Coriolis force is just another example that is mutual force. That happens because all of us are spinning round, but because we don't notice it, that we notice something else as a consequence. That in short, but Coriolis force. So question is, how this Coriolis force, well, Coriolis force degree changes with rotation rate. But if you change rotation rate and change the Coriolis force, how weather changes? So that's the question. Um, yeah, so just repeat the question again. So, well, we have to answer this question somehow. So how we can answer this question? Um, so I propose three ways of doing it. First is to laboratory experiment. Well, idea is, well, you can't change rotation rate of actual Earth. Well, maybe with <laughs> our technology, everything may be possible, but I guess it's not a good idea. So idea of laboratory experiment is create something looks like uh, Earth and change rotation rate of this laboratory Earth. So that's approach number one. Number two is look at the bunch of planets having atmosphere. And those planets are rotating in different way. So idea is looking at those different planets and, and different rotation rate and how weather changes depending on rotation rate and so on, and try to get answer out of those things. And last thing is called theory. Um, I'm not sure. As a boy, I thought science was about experiment, and experiment you find discovery, and, and then that called physical law and blah, blah. And I'm not sure how many of you did it. When you read biography of Albert Einstein, mysterious thing happens. This guy supposed to be working on physics, but he never does experiment. He only works with paper and pencil. And anyway, that's what theory is. And essentially what we are going to do with theory is, is try to explain what we found with laboratory experiment and planetary atmospheres. So that is the idea. Now, laboratory experiment. So this is a way to create weather in laboratory. This is actually um, 
original work done by Raymond High more than half a century ago. He was one of the pioneers figure out how to create weather in, in laboratory. So this is actual setup. And so, oh gee. This is, so this is three cylinders, well, and you put water in the middle and then outside, I think, and you put cold water to this inner cylinder and you put warm water in outer cylinder and then create the temporal difference from equator to pole in this simple system. And there is a water motor here and there's a belt and by tie this motor with this tank, this tank is self-rotate with variant speed. So in short, we create the earth rotating Earth with atmosphere with water. That's the idea. So this kind of snapshot part you can get. Uh, well, you see kind of weather pattern as a top view. Um, and we can do it nicer way nowadays with, in this case, you just put the ice in the middle and you can see much nicer picture colored. And actually this is relatively easy to do. And you just have to find a record player and find a glass water container somehow fit on top of record player, the record player rotate and this water container rotate with record player. So you create the simple rotating earth with atmosphere represented by water. And it's very so easy to do. So we can show this to school kids. She looks very young, but I, pretty much she's an instructor of this demonstration. I built this photo from somewhere from California, American idea called Outreach. And did you say this Polish? That you have it in Geophysical Institute too. So that's we have in this department as well. Now, getting back to this old experiment, I hope you remember. So with this water transmit into this tank and tank can be rotated in different rate. And that thing you can change is the temperature at the middle and outer skirt. So you can change the temperature contrast from outer cylinder and inner cylinder. So this kind of works as a forcing for this, well, laboratory earth. And you can also change rotation rate. So you can get something like this that kind of, we call the phase diagram by changing rotation rate and changing forcing rate by changing temperature contrast. You get, well, you don't have to read. It's not very well described. You get bunch of different regimes, but what I focus is what happens just by changing rotation rate. So this is slowest rotation in this set of experiment, and what we see is, well, wind is flowing only in longitudinal direction. So it's only we get perfect hardware cell in this regime. As you increase the rotation rate, you get kind of meandering so you get goes the or well, this water winds go up from equator to pole and going back equator this kind of circulation and then well you get another well vortex and this vortex number of these waves or vortex whatever way you want increases by increasing rotation rate so this is you get Instead of two structure, you get three of those. And, and I don't know, this is three, but you see f more finer structure. And then I think you see more finer structure. I think you get more uh, blobs, in this case four, and then actually getting more and more noisier and unsteady. So that's kind of behavior we find by doing laboratory experiment of our atmosphere by changing rotation rate. So this is a kind of 
summary with very small rotation, we get something that looks like a hardware cell, very smooth in longitude. And as we increase in rotation rate, these hardware cell homogeneous in longitude breaks down into eddies in longitudinal direction, like a weather of cyclones with low pressure in front in the atmosphere in high latitude. And as we further increase rotations, the weather pattern become more and more irregular. So that's what we get. I think interesting. Yeah, yeah. What about in the outreach experiment? They were not maintaining any temperature. No, 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 no. It it's was just, just a simple. It's very simple one. Yeah. And then Is it actually one thing we discussed was we can demonstrate the same thing here, but then it's we we don't have real weather. So is so it, is it rela dynamic is related? It's related because this structure, well, I don't want to, to make this detour too much, but, well, you see a blue color tube. This is consequence of because this tank is rotating. Otherwise, you will not get it. This is kind of comparison, I suppose. If you don't rotate, it just gets mixing. So that's very simple. Uh, demonstration for rotation does. Uh, so that's the, the summary from Labrador experiment. And now look at planetary atmospheres. Um, there are seven planets having a reasonable amount of atmosphere. And then the uh, satellite called Titan in Saturn have actually twice denser atmosphere than Earth. And so these are set of planets, the f closest to Sun to farther away from Sun in the order. Um, well, this kind of photo I pick up from web, and you know, everyone knows how Earth looks like. These white thing a cloud and blue the ocean, we see some lands. And well, the mass is opposite. This is very thin atmosphere, and we don't see much weather in visible way. So it's, we all essentially see the surface structure, and I, it's hard to find a good picture to see, but this is kind of situation. We see some polar, I think, CO2 clouds, and and other thing is this planet is mostly desert. So we got some often dust storm, and most dramatic cases, it covers the whole planet. And that's kind of dramatic, most dramatic weather event on Mars, but it's boring picture. You get just whole Mars looks like Eurovis covered by dust storm. In this case, you get a bit of dust storm over here and there. So that's how weather looks like. Now, other, well, six objects, all those planets and satellites are almost covered by oh, well, clouds in one way or another. So we can see weather pattern in a more direct way. And I think the most impressive one is Jupiter. You see a banded structure and some spots. And next is Venus, that you see a kind of U-shaped structure associated with winds blowing in this direction. And once, oh, sorry. One thing you have to, I have to emphasize is Venus and Jupiter, you, you can observe relatively easily with this same telescope you can buy with your budget, so to say. And Saturn is kind of similar to Jupiter. You see some band structure, but unfortunately, it's always foggy, and you don't see nice thing. Uranus or Neptune and other planets are all the same. And Titan, it's kind of, you don't see much patterns. So I have to pick up kind of particular photo. Except for Neptune, got this part called dark spot. Well, it's actually lost, so we don't see much future anymore. Uranus is almost flat with visible light. So I decided to, I don't even, this must be ultraviolet or so to see polar structure. And same problem with Titan. We see some cloud. I think in this case, infrared. So that's a kind of well, summary of how weather looks like with diversing planets. And of course, most interesting 
planets look at this mass. Well, that's why I think, because Mars is considered to be most similar planet to Earth, so presumably it has a very similar weather pattern. And difficult thing is it's hard to measure because atmosphere is actually relatively thin. And it's, but nice thing is it's mostly desert. So we can look at the tracer of winds by mark on the desert or sand mark of winds, and you can estimate surface wind distribution in this way. And this is average over longitude as a function of latitude. And of course, curiosity is compared with this Earth. This is surface wind distribution over the Earth, and this is Mars, kind of similar. Well, you judge. And one thing we are going to focus is this, or this kind of networking. This latitudinal structure of winds, well, the profile of wind as a function of latitude focusing on eastward winds. And if you do that, this is a summary we got. This is plot of easterly winds as a function of latitude for those eight terrestrial objects. It's all profile wind speed, eastward positive, uh, and bit of exception is mass is shown as vectors, and Titan I only able to find a height latitude section. Um, now, so that you see, so all the planets rotating diverse different ways, and then you get very different wind patterns with latitude. And oh, I think you can read, I hope. I will get back to this. So, so this is diversity of weather we can see with the different planets and satellites in our solar system. Now, of course, we need some numbers. Um, so rotation period. So this is a list of planets and Titan. Uh, one thing I have to emphasize is all planets and Titan rotate this way from west to east. But major expression is Venus. Venus rotate from east to west. So I, to make this point clear, I put minus sign. And this rotates very, very slow. Titan is quite slow too. So one thing you notice, Earth and Mars rotating similar period. And then Jupiter and Saturn is about twice faster than the Earth. So Simple question is, OK, so Jupiter rotates twice faster than Earth. So its rotation simply twice more important. And something we have to worry is radius of these planets are vastly different. So Jupiter is more than 10 times larger than Earth. So since it's 10 times larger, rotation becomes less important or more important. So that's kind of question. So, so next question to ask is how we can measure degree of importance rotation with diverse size of planets and of course different rotation rate. Uh, so of course we have rotation period and if you do physics you have, you're supposed to count with second and based on this we can define a quantity we may call rotation rate and this is kind of 2 pi divided period, and this 2 pi is actually angle for whole way. This is 2 pi. And because, yeah, it's written here, it's 2 pi is length, circle length with unit radius of circle. So if you take unit length circle, this, this length is 2 pi. So rotation rate means it's kind of rate that this, well, rate that this movement going on with single radius. Now, and then we got certain size of planet. So question is how the size of planet and rotation compete each other. And what we can realize is if you rotate planet, this surface goes with certain speed. 
which we make, yeah, like this, and we may call it a rotation velocity, which is defined by the radius planet multiplied by this rotation rate. And this final answer is clear. Then, well, if you rotate the planet this way, this, this at point at equator moves round distance of two pi multiplied by radius, divided with the period of rotation. So if you divide by period of rotation, this two pi r, you get velocity at right at equator on this planet. So that's the idea of this rotation velocity. So roughly speaking, with rotation velocity is larger, the uh, rotation must be more important for this planet. But what you should compare with is actual wind speed or wind velocity of this planet. So wind is very, very strong in this given planet, then rotation velocity is less important. So the way to decide important, relative importance of rotation with given planet is, I just we summarize all I said, take a ratio of those two things, typical wind velocity divided by rotation velocity. Typical wind velocity, and just give you in, in symbolic way, and then you get this number. I tried to avoid technical word, but this number is called Rossby number. Probably most of you don't even mind remember one word in this talk, Rossby number. Remember this, Rossby number measure how rotation is important in given planet. And then this definition is a bit tricky. Smaller the Rossby number, the rotation velocity relatively stronger. So we have to look for smaller Rossby number to see stronger rotation effect on the planet. And, and conversely, if Rossby number is large, rotation is not important enough for a given planet. So we summarize this. We so we have rotation period and radius for those planets and satellite. Yeah, that's already I saw. And I forgot to explain the numbers. So this is a kind of typical speed with those planets and uh, satellite. So we can compute velocity number. I just keep rotation period as a reminder and this loss speed number. Well, one thing we realize is Venus rotating is so slow, loss speed number is very large. And Titan is almost equally large. So with these object, probably rotation is not that important. Otherwise, all the other planets get loss speed number substantially smaller than one. So we should have important effect of rotation with these planets. And but values, the well, values quite a bit. So idea is just order all those planet satellite in the increasing order of Rossby number. Voila. So Jupiter got strongest effect of rotation. Venus is least in order of Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, Lanus, and so on and so on. I thought this is interesting to look at. I'm not sure. Do you see a kind of pattern going from Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, Uranus, and then down to Venus? Yes and no, it's hard to tell. So look at this wind profile as a function of latitude. It gives you a kind of better idea. Well, Venus got strong westward winds. It's much, much faster than rotation rate, rel rotation velocity, and it's very broad. And Titan gets the same thing, in this case, eastward following rotation, and very, very broad. And Neptune, Uranus is the other way around, but similar. And jump to Jupiter, you, s you see uh, many, many peaks of those eastward, westward winds, and something similar to Saturn, and you get Earth, get two, one jet each at one hemisphere. So you see a two jet over whole sphere. 
And same with smooth. Well, it's not very clear. You kind of get two jet. So kind of conclusion is as rotation effects become more and more important, we see a more peaks of eastward winds with latitude. So that's what we see as a consequence and presumable consequence of uh, rotation effects on the planets. Now, so that's kind of thing I said. It's where profile become finer when atmosphere is more strongly controlled by rotation. And eastward wind profile become conversely as rotation becomes slower, eastward wind profile become broader and broader. So of course question is why this happens. Okay, so it's getting a bit challenging part, but I tried to introduce a very, very idealized atmosphere. And to try to understand how atmosphere works without rotation. We put rotation back, but we try to understand in very simple way how atmosphere works without rotation. And this ideal atmosphere is super idealized. Most people would not like it, but this atmosphere with constant density, like water, and above the surface is vacuum. There's no mass. And you've got the mean depth of H, something like this, and, and then surface somewhere, of course. Um, and then, of course, how this challenge is convinced everyone that this is good model for atmosphere, but just please trust me. And if you study dynamics of atmosphere, you will learn that this model explains most of the important things about flow of the atmosphere. So this is a very, very good model. It's, you, you know, it's much, much easier to work on. So that's a very nice model. And of course, main thing working on this model, at, uh, simple atmosphere, is gravity. So again, we get back this pendulum. So it's like a pendulum. So you get, if you get pendulum, only force working on, well, important force working on this pendulum is gravity. And you swing it, it gets back and forth with certain period, it's oscillate. And it just depends on length of this pendulum. So same thing happens that dri only driving force of this idealized atmosphere is gravity. So you should expect, thing, expect something looks like a pendulum with this simple atmosphere. So but it, it, instead of getting a simple oscillation, actually it's, it's oscillate everywhere. And as oscillate everywhere, you see a wave moving in certain direction. This is a kind of wave called gravity wave. And this speed is proportional to gravity multiplied depth and taking root square, then you get speed of this gravity wave. Well, this gravity wave sounds very abstract, but um, this is gravity wave. And, and this is ocean surface. And well, and same thing is going on in the atmosphere. And only problem, we don't see a easy interface to observe gravity waves. Otherwise, same thing is essentially going inside the atmosphere. Now, so that's the main process going on without rotation in the atmosphere. That is gravity wave with speed of gh root square. And we put rotation back. So rotation velocity is given by length and rotation multiplied rot rotation rate. And now we slightly generate this notion of distance. We can cause any spatial distance, like a length of arm. And this, with length of arm change, rotation velocity, of course, changes. So these two speed compete each other to characterize dynamics. The changing the spatial di distance you look at. It. So this is a way to look at we compute these two velocity as a function of spatial distance. And first thing to notice is 
gravity wave speed is constant with spatial horizontal distance. It only depends on depth. So depth is fixed. Then it's always propagating the same speed. On the other hand, this rotation velocity is proportional to spatial distance. So as spatial scale distance increases, rotation velocity increases linearly, proportionally. So put this. So thing to realize at certain point, so with very small distance, gravity wave is faster. And at certain point, this rotation velocity becomes faster than gravity's wave speed. So there's a kind of crossing point here. We can call it transition scale. And this transition scale turns out to be a very good characteristic scale that defines the weather of the Earth. It turns out to be about 1,000 kilometers on the Earth. So we calculate this number. So take equal gravity wave speed and rotation velocity and get formula for rotation velocity. Then we can compute transition scale to be equal to rotation rate divided by gravity wave speed. So this must be a scale to characterize fineness or crudeness of wind profile with latitude. It's typical scale of weather. And of course, important thing is how this scale looks like compared to size of planet. So we, di we divide this transition scale by radius of planet. OK. Now, well. It looks all fine except for minor difficulties. We don't know how to define depth or gravity speed. And this is atmos idealized atmosphere. So this depth is complicated, so it doesn't co correspond to actual depths of atmosphere. You have to find the depths correspond to actual depths by making this idealization. So it's a bit complicated, and let's keep this part. But it's complicated to calculate. So we just do for now, take a typical value for Earth's atmosphere. It's about 50 meters per second. And then, then just for sake of argument, assume this speed applied to all the atmosphere of the solar planets. It's very crude assumption, but see what happens. So this is a tra relative transition scale, relatively radius. And, and we can reorder this wind profile as a function of latitude in increasing order of transition scale. Well, again, this crude argument doesn't work perfectly. But this, this smallest transition scale gives the, the highest number of, of, well, eastward wind peaks. And Venus getting the largest relative transition scale gives broader scale. And then all the other planets somehow fit into the middle of those gradual transition. So I hope it's not so bad. So conclusions, weather of the atmosphere is characterized by the scale which gravity wave speed become equal to the rotation velocity. I hope everyone somehow learned to read equation. So we call it transition scale. This characterized. So this explains the basic behavior, how weather changes with rotation rate. Uh, so <coughs> once we understood this, planet, planet rotate is faster the scale that characterizes the weather becomes smaller. Well, I hope you see the formula. So this rotation rate controls the transition scale proportionally. So transition scale becomes smaller and smaller as it gets rotated. Oh, no, it's the other way around somehow. Never mind. Yeah, I think I swapped this order. It's actually, it's the other way. I'm sorry. This is gravity wave speed by the rotation rate. So as rotation rate increases, this transition scale becomes smaller and vice versa. 
OC. And if slower, it becomes larger. So it follows that with smaller rotation, whether it's smoother and less <coughs> depending on longitude, and looks like something looks like hardware cell. And with very small rotation, like a Venus and Titan, winds blow very, very fast eastward, well, in di direction rotation, and it's much faster than rotation rate itself. In other, in on the other hand, when the planet rotates faster, then weather realizes in a much, much smaller scale and evolves it also faster. And number jet stream, maximum eastward wind also increases. And more future found in longitudinal direction, like a front and cyclones and so on. Oh, gee. This must be the end. I Oh, yo, I know. So, again, summarize how weather changes in picture with increasing importance of um, effect of rotation. And I hope you can enjoy those images better after going through this talk. Thank you, Ebardo. Okay, thank you very much. We have some time for questions, I guess. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I would like to ask you about the Rosby number because I think I didn't understand fully this concept. If yeah. you can uh, <laughs> explain what does it mean that the Rosby number is uh, really uh, have has uh, the really low value and what does it mean in the simple word yes so simple <laughs> word no no it's simple it's uh, it's good information if, if, or bad if run is rotating then this the every material on the surface moving with okay with the rotation of the speed that's that's a that's a speed of rotation okay actually. And that depends on size of planet and rotation rate. And that's rotation velocity as defined. And you see many things moving as this moves around. And we see a winds and so on. So we compare these winds on the planet and actual rotation okay. speed. And so that okay. ratio measures the importance of, the importance of two things. That's like the Rossby wave. Okay, Is so, it clearer? So, <laughs> okay, so I would like you uh, to, to ask if I um, have good understanding. There. Okay, so can I tell that the w wind of the planet with low uh, value of, of the Rossby number, yeah. the, the, the speed of uh, winter is driven by the speed of uh, Earth rotation? Yeah, oh, no, no. One no? thing I never explained is that something forced the atmosphere to blow in certain speeds. Okay. So that's, I assume, given in this talk. Okay. And <laughs> so faster the rotation doesn't necessarily lead to faster winds. Okay. And opposite example is Venus actually wind blowing much, much farther than rotation rate. It's, okay. not, it's always not rotating, it's just winds blowing very fast, 100 times of rotation speed. Okay. So, it's, it's, so there are many, I, I think I should show you a bottom line of this talk. I, there are many, many things I have to talk, obviously. So I really, I just focus on how rotation work in the weather. So weather got some wind speed defined by something that should be another the free physics uh, talk, I suppose. It takes another one hour. Fair enough. So this is, I think, the same question. Uh, oh my. You, you said that uh, this was this wind, typical wind velocity. Yeah. And you didn't say 
how it is. Uh, no, I skip it. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. I be, think be, I, I should emphasize yeah, no, this know, know, last but, uh, point. But anyway, can, go ahead. Anyway, can can you uh, just say a few words because somehow I know it's few uh, words. Well, it's probably it depending is, on many. No, this is a long story because okay, J okay in Earth's atmosphere it's easy. Well, the sun heats atmosphere, and you know that. Well, this is tricky geometry question. It is better over tropics than pole. So, so, so tropic is warmer than pole, and you get temperature contrast, and it's kind of so. This temperature contrast drives the atmosphere. So that's the main thing, but it's not true for every atmosphere. It's true with Mars and some extent Venus. But if you look at those gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they got substantial heat source from inside. It's not like a sun, it's dead planet, but well, it's dead star, but it still keep the heat from primordial age. And the heat they got from inside is almost equal to energy they got from sun. So with Jupiter and Saturn particularly, the substantial energy source. So the bottom is much warmer than above. Then you get convective instability. So that drives the atmosphere for Jupiter and Saturn. I think this is more than few words. So that this is fascinating story going on, but yeah. Yes. Well, no, no. In this simple atmosphere, with, well, just simple constant density, if you he heating effect is effectively distributing mass with latitude. So you can rotate this simple atmosphere with constant depth. And then heating effect is effectively, which way? That, oh, I should remember. Oh, my God. Heating decreases mass, and cooling increases mass. Well, it's not really mass. Something called, and then you get the slope of depth that drives the atmosphere, well, this ideal atmosphere, and we can work out all the things, well, not all the things, many things along this line. I hope <laughs> good enough for this purpose. Start. Any other question? Or if not, then we can thank the speaker once more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A ja zaproszę od razu na następny wykład 8 grudnia się odbędzie. Także niedługo na naszej stronie pojawi się też ogłoszenie. Także zapraszamy. Dziękuję bardzo.